Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm John DeCandeloro. Uh, I am the collections manager at the Alaska Native Language Archive. Uh, sometimes it's called ANLA or ANLA. Uh, during this presentation, I'm going to try to introduce you to uh, the Alaska Native Language Archive, um, show off some of our collections a little bit. We also have a booth downstairs. That's more where we're showing off our collections today. Um, uh, and I'm going to demonstrate how to navigate our online catalog and try and encourage uh, productive use of our resources. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the Alaska Native Language Archive, as well as the uh, UAF uh, Trothiotha campus, is uh, located on the ancestral lands of the Chena people, whom we thank for their care and stewardship. So what is the Alaska Native Language Archive? Well, um, ANLA is a physical and digital collection of uh, uh, Alaska Native Language resources. It's located on the first floor of Rasmussen Library um, at the UAF campus. Uh, we hold over 15,000 items, uh, including recordings, transcriptions, translations, dictionaries, place names, maps, and files, and linguistics field notes. Uh, we hold records in all Alaska Native languages and some related languages, uh, such as, for example, Navajo or Inuktitut. Um, as we all know, uh, the Alaska Native Language Center was founded by state leg legislation in 1972. Uh, up until 2009, ANLA was ANLC's in-house reference collection, uh, collected and curated by the late Professor Michael Krauss, who aimed to consolidate everything on or in the Alaska Native languages. Uh, so since uh, ANLA was professionalized, we've continued to grow, continued to collect uh, in different areas, um, and uh, continue expanding upon Dr. Krauss's collection. Uh, today, in order to support ANLC's mission of documenting, promoting, cultivating, and revitalizing Alaska Native languages and culture, the archive houses documentation of the various Native languages of Alaska and helps to preserve and cultivate this unique heritage for future generations. As the premier repository worldwide uh, for information relating to the Native languages of Alaska, ANLA is responsible for, for conserving and facilitating access to documentation and resources on Alaska's 20 plus native languages, including through partnerships with native organizations across the state. Uh, we serve researchers, teachers, and the Alaska native communities. So what is available at ANLA? Um, we have both published and unpublished materials. Um, original records include linguistic field notes and audio and video recordings. Uh, published materials include books, off-prints, copies of materials held in other archives, and copies of Alaska Native Language Center publications. The archives reference collection uh, is located on the second floor of Rasmussen, um, and it also houses published materials which support research within these collections. Um, so uh, yeah, the uniqueness of ANLA's uh, collection partly lies in this concentration of materials. The collection also includes important documentation on the development of literacy and education in Alaska Native languages, including the development of writing systems, lesson plans, and educational materials. It's not just of linguistic interest, but also of historical interest. In order to promote public access to these invaluable language resources, a large amount of our collections uh, are digitized and freely accessible through our website, and we're constantly working to make more available. We're also going to be redesigning the website soon. Um, right now, it is not the most usable thing in the world, which is one of the reasons why so much of the presentation is going to be dedicated uh, to using the website uh, effectively. Um, uh, but we're like constantly looking for the best ways to promote access and, and, and make things as usable as possible. Okay, so did I? Oh, no, this is page two. Okay, so using the website. All right, so uh, the primary access point for our collections is our website, uh, which is located at uaf.edu slash ANLA or through your favorite search engine uh, by searching UAF ANLA or the Alaska Native Language Archive. Uh, the website contains our online catalog and links to view and download approximately 75% of the listed resources. Uh, the website works on both desktop and mobile, uh, although sometimes the mobile version can be a little wonky. Uh, we're working to update the website uh, and hopefully make it a little bit more intuitive and usable in the future, but that probably won't be implemented for a few months. So searching the website from the homepage, there are several ways to navigate uh, around the archive. Um, so you can see up there, maybe uh, it's a little uh, small. Uh, we've got fields there uh, for uh, title, uh, identifier, contributor, text, language, collection, and an option to filter uh, by text or audio documents down there at the bottom. 
Uh, searching by, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, that's a little more readable. Okay, uh, searching by title uh, will only search things in the title fields of those records. So you can see up there, I searched curriculum and there you see curriculum appears literally in the title field of every uh, document. Um, uh, so some of those materials are going to be relevant if you're looking for curriculum resources, but you can also see there that it pulls things like a curriculum vitae at the bottom, right? Um, so contributor, uh, oh, let me skip. Well, okay, so identifier. Identifier is a unique call number assigned to each ANLA record. If you're new to using ANLA, I would recommend just avoiding that uh, since they can be a little bit confusing. There's an example one over there on the side. I'll revisit that a little bit in a bit. So contributor. Contributor refers to anyone involved in producing the material found in the archive, uh, such as authors, speakers, interviewers, compilers, or the person responsible for depositing the records at ANLA. Uh, you can search by first name, last name, uh, last name, first name, or just last name. So there I, I did example searches for Edna McLean, McLean slash Edna or McLean. Uh, they all pretty much get the same results. McLean gets a few more um, uh, because it's, it's more general. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so for the time being, you can only search one contributor at a time, uh, which is uh, something that we're working on. Uh, so the text field uh, will search titles as well as any descriptions that we have in the catalog. So this is the most general use field. Um, so for example, going back to searching curriculum and text instead of title uh, yields more results. Um, so if you navigate inside that, uh, uh, the first result that it pulls, see curriculum doesn't appear in the title, but you can see down there in the description field, you can see that it pulled a, another curriculum vitae. Uh, sometimes record descriptions are more detailed. Sometimes they're less detailed. The text field can be used for searching uh, for certain types of records. Uh, it can also be a good place to search for locations. Um, uh, it can be a good place to, if you're, for example, looking for maps, putting map in the text field is generally a good call. Um, uh, it can also be a, a good way of finding records associated with specific speakers, um, right? Because oftentimes, especially with recordings, the recording will be titled the speaker's name uh, and things like that. So that's by searching in text, you're searching title, you're searching descriptions, everything like that. And especially if you have multiple speakers, things like that, often they'll be listed somewhere in the record and text will, will capture that. Um, so generally, first place uh, to search for something in general, text field. Um, we've also got a drop-down menu for languages uh, so that searches aren't thwarted by alternative spellings or names of languages. Um, so if you search for, for example, all Atna records, um, so here we go. Uh, that doesn't mean that all the records pulled are in Atna. It's the subject language, right? So you're going to find uh, records that are relevant to Atna. That doesn't mean that if you don't speak Atna, you're not going to be able to understand anything in them, right? It's, it's the, the subject language. Uh, we also have a number of collections uh, down there. Uh, some of these are more useful than others. Um, in some cases, uh, they're the papers of a certain researcher and others. They might group materials by topic, uh, such as place names. Uh, depending on what you're looking for, this might be more or less useful. It's a work in project. There's an example of like the Lucier collection, uh, which uh, uh, we recently were able to use uh, to good effect to help a researcher out who was looking uh, for a bunch of contemporary Adipiak audio uh, in the 1950s. Um, and, and we found that there, including um, stuff associated with a specific uh, speaker, uh, which was excellent. Um, so sometimes the collections can be useful. Um, down here at the bottom, uh, you can filter uh, your search to look only for text-based or only audio records. Uh, it defaults to both. Um, so for example, here I ran a search uh, in language for Upper Tenana, and then I uh, filtered it uh, by audio. And then all the results that you're going to get there, all 175, are going to be grouped in some way as audio. If you're looking for recordings, if you're looking for samples, um, audio, that's going to be a good way of doing that. If you want to exclude audio and, and just search for like PDFs and things like that, it might be good to search uh, specifically for text. If, you know, you're first getting a ton of like things associated, like, you know, recordings of a specific speaker and you're looking for a transcription or a translation or something like that, right? Okay, 
So identifiers, I, I decided to come back to this. Um, so uh, in general, <laughs> uh, this is the way they're laid out. Don't be too scared by it. So there's this legacy system uh, used to identify, uh, ident uh, to assign identifiers that was developed uh, by Michael Krauss and Jane McGarry uh, in cooperation with the Library of Congress. Uh, so uh, typically identifiers have three components. Uh, the first one indicates the language. So here we have, for example, CY for Central Yupik. Uh, the middle two, the numbers and the letter, uh, both refer to the author. So here, the R refers to Irene Reed, and 961R specifically refers to Irene Reed. Uh, her first academic work on Central Yupik was in 1961. So that's the 961R. So CY961R are all going to be Irene Reed on Central Yupik. And then at the end is the date of the record. So 1974, uh, you don't have to search entire identifiers because we don't have a way to search for dates. Um, oftentimes, if you're looking for uh, records associated with a specific date, it can be useful to you know just put in 1999 there, for example, right? Uh, and then it's going to pull things with those 1999 identifiers. Uh, and that can be an efficient way to search for those sorts of things. Um, a lot of the time that's not going to work for the audio because of the way that the, their identifiers work, which is is a little bit less systematic, but um, this can be a good way to find these, you know, approximate records uh, that are relevant to your search. Um, yeah, so uh, you can combine all these fields uh, to construct uh, complex searches. Um, if at any time you want to restart your search, uh, you can just go back up to the top and click on Alaska Native Language Archive, and it'll just return you to the home screen. So um, now I want to show you around a couple records to familiarize you with how things are kind of laid out. Uh, so this is an example search. I searched for Aurora uh, in text, and you'll notice that the result down there next to the identifier, there's this little CD icon. Uh, so that means that that file has attached media. Um, so, and, and those are usually going to be PDFs or like a WAV file or something like that. So if you click on the identifier uh, and enter the resource details page uh, for that record, uh, you can see there a short description as well as additional comments, uh, as well as contributors, dates, format, and languages. Um, the coverage field, uh, when it's included, uh, is usually a geographical location, um, such as you know for a map or something like that, uh, or like the village where a particular recording was taken. A uh, linguistic type uh, typically uh, refers to like the general kind of work represented, such as lexicon or primary text or something like that. Uh, but usually it can be ignored. A lot of those are inaccurate and, and need to be redone. Um, uh, so what really matters here is the files field. Uh, the files field at the bottom. So you can see down there uh, that there is a PDF uh, that is hyperlinked. So if you like just click there on that like highlighted uh, PDF, then it'll bring up the PDF in another page. Um, uh, here, this uh, page is fully available uh, to view or download. A ton of the archive is freely available like this. Um, now let's look at an audio file. Uh, so here, uh, I searched by language uh, for uh, Yupik, for Central Yupik, and I filtered by audio. And then uh, first thing uh, is Yupik songs. Uh, you can click on that again, then it'll bring you to the resource details page. There, uh, the description uh, will give you details for the side A and side B of the track uh, that this was extracted from. And then down there at the bottom, uh, we've got an A and B wave files. Uh, so if you click on those, so for example, A, um, this is what it'll look like. Uh, here, I pulled this up on my phone so that I can play a little bit of this. Do, do, do. Let's see. Yeah. So you can get a little bit of like America the Beautiful and Yupik, right? Um, <laughs> um, right? It, it just says right there, see, side A, America the Beautiful, then the Alaska flag song, twinkle, twinkle, little star, right? Um, uh, so all this stuff is available um, and you can, again, access it freely via the website. Uh, you can download it um, uh, by uh, clicking on the uh, little three dots over there and, you know, just download it however you would through your browser. Um, cool. So what happens uh, if the document you want to view is not digitized? Uh, if it's an audio file, uh, you can reach out to us, uh, contact me, uh, and we'll prioritize it for digitization. Uh, and if it's a reasonable quantity of paper files, uh, also let me know and we'll see if it's, you know, something that we can scan and, and put up in a, a reasonable amount of time or, or get to you otherwise. 
Um, if you want to work with a larger quantity of materials or view them in person uh, and you can get to campus, uh, reach out uh, and you can schedule an appointment in the research room. Uh, we've got an agreement with the Alaska Polar Regions Collections and Archives uh, in their, uh, to use their very, very nice research room on the second floor of Rasmussen Library. Um, it's open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to noon and 1 to 4. Uh, again, just call or email us and we'll set you up an appointment and like let us know what you want to bring up. Ideally, if you can give me the identifiers, that would be good. But also if you want to, you know, describe it, we can work and, and, and figure out, you know, how to get you what you need. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Whoops. Thank you. Yes. If we want, we, if we have material recordings, uh, you know, that we found or created that we want to be put into the archive, how do we go about doing that? And also if some of that material, you know, we want to have some sort of restricted status on it, what is the process for both of those things? Excellent question. Um, so if you uh, want to do that, reach out to us. Uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, we've got a deed of gift uh, for depositing materials. Um, on that, it includes some stuff on restrictions. Um, in general, we are trying not to accept things with particularly strenuous restrictions. Uh, we can make, you know, exceptions in cases of like privacy, um, embargoes, insofar as we can accommodate them. Uh, what we're trying to do on our new system is basically in, uh, add a new metadata field um, that uh, basically describes any general restrictions uh, that you want. Like if, if there's something is culturally sensitive and for example, should only be like viewed by women, right? Or, or li listened to by women. Um, we don't have the resources nor particularly the will to like be in charge of gatekeeping that. Um, so what we are planning to do on the new website is basically have a, an agreement uh, that you click through at the beginning, like a pop-up that's like, here are the terms and conditions of using the website. You know, one of them is, is please, you know, respect, respect any conditions uh, specified down here in the metadata. Um, uh, and then we'll like add that additional like rights field uh, that will help document that um, so we can do that. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, like very private information, um, in some cases, um, you know, like, I, I mean, we're, we're, you know, not going to put up at, like social security numbers or anything like that. Um, uh, but, you know, it, uh, sometimes depending on what it is, it might be best, you know, not to necessarily donate that to us specifically, um, uh, just because we cannot in all cases, uh, you know, guarantee that that institutional memory will be fully preserved over time. And like, we can try to document that as best as possible. Uh, but, um, you know, like dealing with those access restrictions is, is like one of the bigger challenges that we're dealing with, um, and, and trying to find a, a sustainable way that we can do it. That doesn't over like promise what we can't deliver effectively. Yeah. Establishing our, oh, thank you, Maggie. At Northwest campus, we want to establish an archive that where we will collect material over the next five years that material we've collected, produced, developed, our students have produced, our mm -hmm. adjuncts have produced. Can you, um, can we use you and, and all we would ask is not about that access, but mm -hmm. any, we would want everybody to access it, but mm -hmm. can it be categorized as being part of that, our five-year project? Uh, what do you mean? Like as, as part of a, a collection? Yeah, so we can show to the grantor that yes, we established an archive and this is what went into it. Yeah, yeah, uh, like reach out to me and and um, okay. like we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably schedule a phone call with the director, Anna, Anna Berge, and talk about that. That sounds exactly like the sort of thing that we're interested in developing further. Awesome. Yeah, I have a question. I have these really old, old <laughs> tapes, Yeah, like eight, not eight track, but, um, and they're from a, a man named Papa John from the Mary's Igloo area. And I think they're in Inupiaq. He spoke Inupiaq. So I don't know about the quality now of them. I mean, that's such really, really old mm -hmm. digitization on those. It's like, not even like on, on reel to reels? That you put in the cassette tape. Oh, And yeah. I think they have old stories in there. I know as time goes on, they're going to be, if not erased or damaged now. Yeah. Um, 
do you do any of that kind of restoration or trying to recover what's on them? Um, I mean, and so I don't we, even know what's on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so right now we're planning on tentatively, we're, we're uh, looking at a few grants um, on uh, getting some of our stuff professionally digitized as well. Uh, like we, we do digitize individual uh, cassettes uh, within our own collection or trying to work through the backlog of that. Um, but because like, at this point, most cassettes have technically expired, uh, and they do require, um, you know, a, a, a decent amount of care. Uh, we're preferring to get that stuff done professionally if we can. Uh, we could, I could recommend you a few sources on that. I know who uh, Oral History uh, uses. They um, use someone associated with a, um, I think, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, uh, or like these uh, specific. Um, like standards. Uh, talk to me about that afterwards and, and I'll, I'll look at my email or, or yeah, just email me. That's, that's good. And, and, and we, we can figure out what to do with that. And, and also like, I mean, uh, if you're interested in like, you know, um, like maybe a partnership or something like that, we can maybe have those conversations and, and figure out what to do with that. Yeah. The audio, um, documents that you have are digitized. Um, I think about 75%, something like wow. that. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. And you guys are planning on digitizing everything? Uh, in so far as we can. Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what we can actually get. Um, um, uh, again, like we're, we're going to, uh, like we've got a lot of NEP doc tapes, especially, uh, that are uh, back there that need to be digitized. I'd say that that's one of the bigger weaknesses that we have. I know that Jason's been working great, uh, doing a great job at digitizing, uh, pretty much the totality of the Gwich N collection. Um, um, uh, so uh, it, it, it like varies from language to language. Um, uh, and there are definitely some gaps in there, uh, but there, yeah, there were, have been some significant waves in the past of like sending them off again, like getting, sending them off site to get them professionally done and back. And now a lot of them are up there. Uh, so, I mean, again, sometimes people discover holes and things like that, or like discover that something's been digitized backwards or something along those lines. <laughs> if you find those things, please like, again, reach out to us, tell us, uh, and, and, and we'll try and prioritize that for redigitization or try to find the missing tape if, if we can. Um, That's really cool. And I just have one more question. This one might be a little bit silly. Um, uh, how does Project Jukebox fit into the, like, are they connected at all? Or No. So pro, uh, Project Jukebox is uh, through the oral history archive, okay. uh, which is separate. Um, I know that they've, I mean, they, they just like put up like their big ANSA collection, things like that. Uh, we're, we're not, uh, ANLA isn't affiliated with that. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. We'll do our last question with Deanna. Um, it's more of a comment. I was able to um, look up Chief Andrew Isaac, and it was on Moose Hunt recording. At, and at the end of this, listen to this. This is what a message he left for this generation and previous generations. He said, this is the way your grandfather's people, your grandmother's people, your aunt, uncle, forefathers, people, they like you to be understand. That is your leader, you young generation. That is your first people in Alaska. You young generation, soon you heard this word. Think about what word you like. I tell you in a class written down and use it. You learn quite a bit different. My individual Indian ideas are like you learn Indian way, are like you learn white man way. Two way you stand. Also like you have two life. When you get used to it, you make a living out of it. You get understand out of young generation behind you. That is why I put as much as I understand to remember and back in old days and my old folks, how they used to do. I try to put it in best I can and thank you. God bless you people. Isn't that so amazing? <laughs> you left that for us. And I grew up in Dot Lake. Um, I'm Deanna, I used to be Deanna Charles, Deanna Fitzgerald, and 
just my grandmother was next door and he's just three houses down and he um, chief andrew isaac grew up in ketchum stock and lake mansfield and tanacross area and then um, he's one of our traditional chiefs for um, tana chiefs conference but i just wanted to share that <laughs> absolutely thank you Thank you, John. I think we have a gift for you to wrap up your presentation. Another round of applause for John.